Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today we continue the sermon series for such a time as this, Seven Lessons for Living Through Pandemic Times. If there ever was a book of the Bible where you could glean something about what it would be like to live through a pandemic time, it is surely here in the book of Exodus. Over the summer, the Hebrew scriptures have set the stage for God's continuing work for God's people. Today, we turn the page to hear more about the story of the Hebrew people. Some of the work on this sermon started in a seminar that I attended a few years ago with the Reverend Dr. Anna Carter Florence, a homiletics professor at Columbia Theological Seminary. It is her offering that opened up new pathways to hear this remarkable story of strong, courageous, and faithful women willing to not follow the rule of law, but instead flip power and authority on its head. And I'm grateful for her word that helped shape this sermon today. The setting for the story that Stacy read a few moments ago, as you know, is ancient Egypt, in the capital city along the River Nile. In the text, we too wade into the murky waters to get a picture of the challenging history of the Hebrew people. These rich stories provide interesting origins for Moses. These stories and these faithful, defiant, and bold women are what laid the foundation for everything Moses was able to do. And in the end, it is the actions of these women that sets the whole of the Exodus story into motion. Shipra, Pua, Miriam, and Pharaoh's daughter, it is their actions and their refusal to cooperate with oppression that makes everything Moses does possible. It is through their decisions and their choices that God begins the liberation of a whole people from bondage. The Hebrew people had been in Egypt for almost 400 years by the time of these stories. They came with Joseph and his family, and the Hebrew people lived for many years, a full part of the Egyptian community. But as time passed, and as the Hebrew population grew, and as they became more and more prevalent within the Egyptian society, things changed. And when a new king came into power over Egypt, a king who operated out of fear, things changed for the worse. The king feared the Hebrew people. And despite them being, in, being so much a part of their society, he saw them as other. It was us and them for this king. And the king was worried about the sheer numbers alone. They could, not, they could turn on the Egyptians, and they could fight with their enemy, enemies and overthrow the Egyptian empire. This new king is fearful, intimidated, worried. And when one is fearful and intimidated and worried, he is rarely at his best self. So he, he creates new laws that are designed to oppress the people and make life impossible for them to prosper. He wants to beat them down and keep them under control. And when that doesn't work, and they grow further in number and spread across the land, he decides to enslave them and puts them to work in the harshest of conditions. But God's people are resilient. And even under the most broken and unjust systems, new life finds a way. Here, even in slavery, even under life-threatening conditions and brutal work, the Hebrew people are fruitful, and they multiply and grow in strength. And while the Hebrews grow in strength, the king grows in his fear of them. So he goes even further and decides to destroy the Hebrew people altogether by making sure they don't have a future. The Pharaoh knows, target the boys of the people you want to dominate and eventually you will destroy them. That's genocide. He has every newborn baby boy killed. 
To accomplish this, he decides to call on the Hebrew women responsible for delivering babies. These are our Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. A quick fun side note, names are important in the Bible. The king in these stories, the Pharaoh, the one who has, is seen as a demigod, he isn't even really given a name in this story. But the people who are, that are named are these poor, beaten down slave women. These midwives have names, Shifra and Pua. And their names in Hebrew mean little flower and lovely, which makes what happens next even more ironic. The all-powerful Pharaoh of Egypt who has statues and temples carved in his honor, developed an unjust policy out of fear of losing power. And he calls on little flower and lovely forward to enforce his laws. But instead, little flower and lovely defy his orders and then lie to his face about it. I can only imagine what that would be like. Being brought before the leader of your people being commanded to participate in something so blatantly wrong, and then having the strength and the courage to go against it. The Bible tells us that lovely and little flower decide to disobey their king because they respected God more than they respected their king. Because they saw that their king's laws and ways of governing did not align with God's justice. And so this is one of the main themes that we will continue to encounter in the book of Exodus, and really throughout the Bible. Here we see our worldly understanding of authority and power and justice turned upside down and questioned so that we can better understand God's authority and God's power and God's justice. In God's eyes, it's not the mighty and powerful who are favored. It's not the ones with their names in history books. Rather, it's unexpected people, the faithful and righteous people from the fringes, people who are often overlooked in history. These are the ones who are called by God. These are the ones who God names. These are the ones who step up to lead God's people and change the course of history. Sounds a lot like resistance, doesn't it? Resistance is a powerful thing. We also hear the story of a mother desperate to keep her baby alive. She's willing to put her three-month-old baby into a woven reed basket lined with what is the ancient equivalent of Kevlar and put him in the river between the reeds. And she knows that he might not survive, but it might be his best chance. And she sends her daughter, the baby's older sister, into the reeds to stand watch, wading into the murky waters. They are trusting in a God of life. We also hear the story of Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, who comes to bathe in the river. And she finds a basket, and this basket, and opens it to find the baby. She's enamored. It says she took pity on him. And the princess shares an important truth here, saying this must be one of the Hebrews' children. And Miriam the baby's older sister, who is keeping a close watch on the baby brother, steps out of the reeds and offers to go and find a Hebrew woman to nurse him. The princess knew what she was supposed to do when she found a baby boy. She was supposed to turn the basket over in the waters and drown him. She knew what was the law, her father's law. And she knew it required that she turn the basket over and that she was supposed to uphold that law. But standing there in the murky waters, the path ahead of her seemed really unclear. Yet these two young girls 
found one another. I imagine their eyes meeting through the reeds. And the two young girls took action to save this boy's life. Miriam went to her mother, the baby's mother, so that she could nurse her son. And the princess took a big risk, offering to pay this mother wages if she would nurse him. And when the child grew up, the woman brought him to the princess, and the princess took him as her own. Without these women, through this story, who dared greatly, who brokered a deal to save a baby in a basket, there is no Moses, no Exodus, no liberation of the people of God. And sometimes it's difficult to see life in the murky waters. And yet sometimes in the midst of challenging circumstances, like the ones these women faced, it helps to tell the truth, to clarify our decision-making and navigate turbulent times. One needs to start by telling the truth. Resistance is a powerful thing, and truth-telling is huge. Like Shipra and Pua, Miriam and the princess defy what was expected of them. They found clarity together in what they saw in front of them on the banks of the river in the reeds. And when I read this text, I'm inspired by these courageous actions of these women. I'm reminded that when our relationship to God is clear, all of our other priorities fall into place. Pastor Jill Duffield notes that in the story of Shipra and Pua, it is evident how clear their relationship is to God. The midwives respect God. The knowledge and acknowledgement is that God must be obeyed, not Pharaoh. That the fear of God gives them fortitude and courage and bravery to spare this Hebrew baby. When we know who God is, we stand a better chance at not conforming to this world, but instead living a life of service and justice and love. Sober judgments accompanies a clear understanding of who God is and subsequently who we are. And such a confession becomes foundational for God's work in us and through us. So I don't imagine that Shipra and Pua plan to risk their lives and stand up to Pharaoh that day when they decided to respect God no matter the cost. And when these girls from completely different backgrounds standing in the murky waters knee deep among the reeds with the child between them, they chose a different path that neither of them thought. They chose a new way forward. One that God had opened for them. I don't know about you, but lately I've been feeling like I'm standing in the midst of murky water, living in murky water, really. Uncertain of so many things. Things I used to know suddenly seem cloudy and complicated. The air is a tinge of fear and anxiety and lots of things feel unknown. And there are times when we feel so sure of what is right and wrong, so sure of the direction our life is taking us. And then there are other times when we are adrift in the basket, at the mercy of the rippling waters, unsure of anything or anyone, unsure of what the future holds. I think the book of Exodus has a lot to say about people in murky waters like these. Sometimes we find ourselves with the stark choice to conform to this world, play it safe, or to proclaim a truth and respect God and be bold regardless of what comes next. Sometimes we find ourselves staring at the stark contrast of which direction to turn or making a decision between good and evil, 
of choosing light and love or darkness and despair. What these stories with what these stories share about living in and out of murky waters, they tell us that it is God who will give us the words and God who will give us the fortitude to act when we need to. Maybe you find yourselves these days in one of those uncomfortable, murky spaces, a place that's not offering you joy, a situation that is not allowing you to be your best self. Maybe it's in the workplace, or maybe it's in the relationship that you thought was too perfect to be shattered. And here you are wading into murky waters, where your purpose now seems kind of cloudy. Alert and aware of your surroundings, prepared for any dangers that come, God provides a way forward even when you think the way is not clear. God provides a way to step out of those murky waters and live in new and a hopeful way. Because God does God's best work in the uncomfortable and the unclear places of our lives. It is in the murky waters where God's liberating work begins. So living in and out of the murky waters means that we might have to take a risk, trusting that someone may meet us there in the midst of it and to help us reimagine a new way out. And we trust that God will catch us and will guide us and in time set us free. May it be for us as it was for the women back then. Amen.